Hello, friend. Say, what do you suppose is the most important part of your body? Well, some people might say the feet are the most important since we all have to walk. Others say the eyes, because seeing is so necessary. It would be difficult to get along without the hands, wouldn't it? Or you might think the heart is the most important part, since its beating shows that we're alive. Well, we're alive. Well, we're alive. Well, all of these, hands, feet, eyes, heart, and the ears, the nose, the mouth, too, are all very important. But the most important of all is the brain. The brain of man is a wonderful, partly mysterious organ that it has taken nature millions of years to create. Which do you think is the most important part? Some say the eyes, some say the heart, some say the mouth, and some others say the nose. Some say the bones on which you hang your clothes. Some say the lungs for the air we breathe. And if you like to eat, you might say the teeth. Some say the feet, and some people say the hands. But I say the brain, because it makes the plans. The brain is very necessary, cause it makes the plans. Now which do you think is the most important part? Some say the eyes, but some say the heart. Some say the mouth, and some others say the nose. Some say the bones on which you hang your clothes. Some say the lungs for the air we breathe. And if you like to eat, you might say the teeth. Some say the feet, and some people say the hands. But I say the brain, because it makes the plans. The brain is very necessary cause it makes the plans yes the brain is the part of the body that makes all the other parts work it's something like a big uh, switchboard from which the orders go out to the rest of the body walk feet pick up that baseball hands watch out for that automobile eyes mmm smell that flower nose Years ago, there used to be an actor in the movies called Mantan Moorland. I remember a scene where he thought he saw a ghost. He wanted to run away, so he said, feet, get moving. <laughs> it made everyone laugh. But actually, the brain sends out messages of that sort all day long, although it doesn't have to transmit actual words to the various parts of the body. To help it decide what you ought to do, the brain takes in messages from the various parts of the body. The senses, such as the sense of sight, the sense of smell, touch of hearing, gather this information for the brain. Why do you suppose everybody seems to have a nose? Everybody has an eye or two. I know, do you? A nose is made to smell all the flowers in the dell on a lovely day in spring. Your eyes were meant to see Every single tree Now isn't that a wonderful thing? Why on earth, my dear Does everybody have a pair of ears? Everybody has a mouth as well I'm here to tell you The marvelous reason Ears were meant to hear Music loud and clear Kissing and whistling and smiling and talking and such. Now isn't it wonderful we all can do so much? Isn't it wonderful we all can do so much? Now, how do you suppose the brain receives and sends out messages? Well, you know, when you turn on a light, electric current flows through a thin wire till it gets to a light bulb, and it makes the light bulb shine. All over your body, there are very tiny wires called nerves. 
that run from the brain to all parts of your body and back again. The central switchboard, the brain, actually has about 10 billion nerve cells. And 24 hours a day, they're constantly receiving and sending out messages by means of electrical impulses that travel from 2 to 200 miles an hour. The brain, which rests very comfortably inside your hard skull, so it'll be well protected, is not really just one large organ, but has separate sections that take care of different kinds of jobs. Let me tell you about four of these sections. Inside and underneath is a part called the cerebellum. It's connected to the brain stem, which comes up out of the backbone. The backbone, you see, protects big bundles of nerves. The cerebellum mostly takes care of information coming from the muscles and helps send messages back to the muscles so that you can move around and jump and walk and throw things and dance and so forth. Thank goodness that you've got a cerebellum. If they ask you just what is it, well, you tell them. If you didn't have one, you would surely lie there till the buzzards came along and said, oh, hi there. When you were a baby, your cerebellum helped you to learn to crawl, then later to stand up, to walk, and to run. It remembers all the separate little parts of these movements for you so that you can do them while thinking of something else. Thank goodness that you've got a cerebellum. If they ask you just what is it, well, you tell them. If you didn't have one, you would surely lie there Till the buzzards came along and said, oh, hi there. Just above the cerebellum is a section called the thalamus. The thalamus has a very pleasant job. It receives all those interesting messages from the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the skin. For example, when you say you're hearing the beetles or seeing a sunset or feeling the water when you go swimming, it's mostly the thalamus that actually enjoys all these lovely sensations. The thalamus does a marvelous thing Sees objects move and the hears bells ring It tells if things are cold or hot If you taste or smell, it tells you what Woo! The thalamus does marvelous things, sees objects move and hears bells ring. Well, it tells if things are cold or hot, if you taste or smell, it tells you what. Woo! One of the most interesting parts of the brain lies just above the thalamus. It's called the limbic system. Believe it or not, it's the place where emotions come from. The word emotion sounds like motion, doesn't it? And that helps you to understand its meaning. An emotion is a feeling that moves you to act one way or another. Feeling happy is an emotion. Feeling sad is an emotion. Feeling frightened is another. And so is feeling angry. The limbic system tells when you're sad, when you're afraid, or when glad when your fierce says a lion or a peaceful as a dove and the best of all it helps you love would you feel angry if somebody stole your favorite toy certainly you would but if you didn't have a limbic system in your brain you wouldn't you just stand by and watch somebody run off with your roller skates or your baseball or your toy car and you wouldn't feel any emotion at all now, in the case of unpleasant emotions, you might think that wouldn't be such a bad idea. But, unfortunately, you wouldn't feel the nice emotions either. If your father or uncle picked you up and gave you a big kiss, you wouldn't feel happy the way you do now. Or if your mother or grandmother tucked you into bed at night and told you a nice story. Without a limbic system, you wouldn't enjoy that at all. And you wouldn't feel good about eating ice cream or going on a picnic either. So, it's a good thing we all have limbic systems in our brains. Well, the limbic system tells when you're sad or when you're afraid or when you're glad 
when you're fierce as a lion Or a peaceful as a dove And the best of all It helps you love Best of all It helps you love It helps you love The fourth part of the brain is the one you and I are most interested in now because up to now all the brain functions we've been talking about are pretty much the same as for animals. You see dogs and cats and monkeys and giraffes too can all see and hear and smell and run and jump and play and be frightened or have a good time. But the fourth part of the brain, the cortex, is something very special to man. Part of the cerebrum, it's just a thin, wrinkled, gray covering that fits over the top of the brain. And it's the part we think with, and remember with, and decide with. The cortex is a fantastically complicated computer with billions of cells capable of storing and sorting out a tremendous amount of information. All of this electrical activity in the cerebral cortex uses up a great deal of energy. That's why sometimes you can feel tired after doing a lot of hard thinking or doing homework, just as you may feel tired after doing hard physical work. Another amazing thing about the cortex is that different parts of it take care of different activities of the body. One part, for example, controls your ability to speak. Another part might have to do with remembering things that you've seen or heard. Cortex a computer, it's a real troubleshooter Cause it helps to organize the things you learn Well it takes the information that you get from each sensation Commits everything to memory in its turn It helps you to remember, speak and think And does it all much quicker than a wink You'll need a note club or revolver for your cortex problem solver will apply the rules of reason for you. If you know enough not only to come out of the rain but to invent an umbrella uh, then let me explain. You're using the highest part of your brain. The cortex. I said the cortex. Mr. Cortex. We For thousands of years, parents and teachers have taught little children how to read, how to write, how to work with numbers, and how to do other things. Oddly enough, apparently no one has ever taught little children how to think. Partly as a result, few people are really excellent at thinking, just as few people are especially good at playing the piano, or running with a football, or working out very difficult mathematical problems. Each of us is provided with a brain but few people are given any instruction in how to use the thinking or reasoning parts of their brains. What I'm trying to do is to teach you about your own wonderful brain and how to use it. If you use it as wisely as possible, in the long run your life will very probably be happier, you'll get along better with other people, and life will be less difficult for you than it may sometimes seem now. The wonderful news is that just by deciding to do so, you can help the cortex of your brain make better decisions, help it to make better judgments about the thousand and one pieces of information it receives every minute of the day. Here are nine simple rules that help me to think better. They should be helpful to you too. Here's rule number one. Control your emotions. Let's suppose someone is mean to you. There are some people who believe that the thing to do in that sort of a situation is to get even. But you can never really get even. Usually what you do by acting mean yourself is cause more trouble. You may make the other person angrier than he was before, and then he may do something even more harmful to you. This is not to say that you may never stand up for your rights, but in most instances, by acting like a better person yourself, you may shame the mean person into wanting to act in a more decent manner. If you act the way the other person did, 
then you sink to his level. But if you show him good example, you may lift him to your level. Remember, any dumbbell can pick up a stick and hit somebody else over the head with it. But a person who knows how to think, a person who will use his intelligence, will usually act in a more human way. Why do I use the word human? Well, because those who let their emotions, from the limbic system, you remember, those who let their emotions overrule the cortex are letting the animal part of their natures overrule the human part. Such people often become angrier than they should, tend to have a great many arguments, perhaps to cry a great deal, to be frightened more than they should, and all in all, to cause themselves a great deal of trouble. Now, emotions are important and necessary, but you must try to see that the cortex is the boss, so that you can become the master of your emotions and not let your emotions become the master of you. Control your emotions as much as you can. Little babies can't do it, but a real man can. Whenever you're sad or you're feeling cross, don't let your emotions be the boss. Control. As much as you can Little monkeys can't do it But humans sure can Whenever you're angry Or feeling blue Don't let your Now here's rule number two for good thinking. Understand the difference between fact and opinion. A fact is something that is really true. For example, the first president of the United States of America was George Washington. That's a fact. It's also a fact that you're listening to my voice right now. But let's suppose you and a friend are eating oh, banana ice cream cones. And I ask you both, does banana ice cream taste delicious? You might say, Oh, yeah. And your friend might say, Yeah, no. Now, which is fact and which is opinion? Well, both the yes and the no are opinions. An opinion just tells how you feel about something, whether you like it or not. Now, it would be very silly for you and your friend to argue about the banana ice cream because both of you are giving your honest opinion. Nobody is right and nobody is wrong. It's perfectly okay to have opinions. We all have thousands of them. But don't make the mistake of thinking that your feelings about things are the same as facts. Another kind of opinion might be called a wrong fact. For example, it may be your opinion that the state of Florida is just north of California, but it isn't. So you can have an opinion about a fact, and your opinion may be right or wrong. The important thing is, remember the difference between facts and opinions. Hello, little Joe, now what do you know that two and two are four? Very good, no anything more than an apple has a core. Oh, well, hello there, Pearl, you're a smart little girl. You know that the earth is round, vibrations make a sound, and there's iron in the ground. Sharp as an axe if you know that facts are the only things we say are true. But there are some who are so darn dumb, they don't know that opinions are opposite to you. Well, I know that Roy, you're a smart little boy, and it really is terrific. 
traffic uh, that you think so good. Don't you wish folks would be much more, much more scientific? Well, we've covered quite a lot of ground. Let's take a break for a minute or so, and then I'll meet you again on the other side of this record. All right? <laughs> 